promised folk I would take a photo from the stage. So, oh, you're looking gorgeous. Hi, <laughs> so a few fair folk turned down then, I see. <laughs> also, you'll have to forgive the paper I've got. It's the only A5 that I can find. Right, right now, I'm technically still an MP. Can you not hear it? I'll just need to show you then, how's that? Cool. Just now, I am still technically a, a member of parliament. And actually, I want to start off with an apology uh, to my colleague Alison Fulis because I, I forgot to notify her that I was going to an event in her constituency. Um, but considering that we are all here for the same reason, I don't think she'll mind too much because we're all here for independence. Yeah. Now, the last time I spoke here, was in 2014 and I'm glad to see that the crowd is just as big <laughs> now as it was then and I'm now going into my third election after facing off my third Prime Minister and yet we are regularly told that we are not respecting democracy we are regularly told that we are not respecting the result of any referendums that have happened, whether it be 2014 or 16, they're wrong. The key difference between us and those who criticise us is that we do not fear referendums. We do not fear democracy. This here right now is democracy. The very presence of myself and my SNP colleagues serves as evidence that we respect the outcome of referendums. Because we said to Scotland, okay, we haven't convinced you yet, but at least let us go down there and fight to make sure we get everything that we were promised. If anything, it seems to me that it is actually the winners of these referendums who are terrified of democracy and terrified of being held to account for the promises that they have failed to deliver time and time again. Which brings me on. Can I Rachel? Rachel. This is all we've got, so I'm sorry. I'll shout as best I can. But the next point, this brings me on to the Labour Party. Now the Labour Party once was, for me and for many others, a political giant that somehow lost its way and ended up hand in hand with the Tories. And I, like many others, felt that Jeremy Corbyn could have been a different direction. He's even gone so far as to nick half the policies that we've already implemented up here, which is flattering in a sense, I suppose. And he, for example, he's actually given credit where it is due to the likes of my colleague Alison Fulis and her fight against the rape clause that has been forced upon Scotland. And yet, just a week ago, he was up in Motherwell campaigning, saying that the Scottish Government could do something about this abhorrent policy, even though he knows it is reserved. And he's done that with multiple issues. In my book, that's called deception. The Labour Party has been promising home rule for years and it has never delivered it. Time and time again it has passed up the opportunity. And yes, we can tinker about with the Scotland Act. Yes, we can devolve the odd thing. 
But the truth is, there is one legal fact which stands out, and that is section 28, subsection 7. And I need you to stick with me here because I'm getting geeky. <laughs> this section does not affect the power of the Parliament of the United Kingdom to make laws for Scotland. No matter what is devolved to us, ultimately nothing affects the power of Westminster to make laws for Scotland. And just last week we heard Boris Johnson saying, I think the SNP will forfeit all right to manage the NHS. We cannot afford to be naive. The only way to protect our parliament is to become an independent country. Some say that we all get to participate in Westminster elections for representatives that we feel will stand up for our interests. And that is true. But if you remove the Scottish vote from the overall vote, in any general election, the result would remain unchanged. In 1979, 1983, 87, 92, 97, 2001, 2005, even in 2010, we voted Labour and still got Tory. Vote Labour to keep out the Tories, we're told. Scotland has woken up to that myth and we will not be made to feel guilty about it. Scotland currently has 59 MPs out of 650. To put that into context, the city of London has 73. We are in a situation where we can and are regularly outvoted by one city, the second largest nation in this family of nations. And I say this, yes, because Brexit is a problem and it's the problem of the day. But let's not forget the concentric scandal, the Windrush scandal, Cambridge Analytica, the chaos of universal credit, the failure to deliver payments to the 3.8 million waspy women living in this country. We can only ever guess what the problems of the future will be. And let's not forget, in 2014, the idea of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister with Nigel Farage nipping at his heels, that was a warning. Now it is a sobering reality. And what I want to know is that if Scotland genuinely was an economic strain on Westminster, if we genuinely were subsidised, why did he want to keep us? The Tories wouldn't subsidise a spare bedroom. What makes you think they would subsidise a whole country? Imagine giving your wages to your neighbour and then letting them decide what you can spend. I would go as far as to say that as a nation we have been conditioned for years. A constant drip drip effect that we aren't good enough, that no one can understand our accents. Now I understand that most people's instinct is to find that that is a an insult to their intelligence. And I understand that, but that's exactly how it works. We think it's normal because we've been told no different. Scotland is too small. We have similar populations to Norway, to Finland, to Ireland, to New Zealand. Are they too small? Scotland's too poor and needs the rest of the UK more than it needs anyone else. Scotland's international exports 
have grown three times faster than our exports to the rest of the UK. We're told that Scotland would need to start from scratch, but we've already established differences in so many systems. Education, law, devolution has allowed us to take a different path wherever possible. One of dignity, inclusivity and compassion. We already fork out a hundred million pounds every year mitigating the worst of austerity. What if we instead could take all that talent, all that energy and all that money and reinvest it in renewables and in infrastructure and in people? There is one thing I have to give Westminster credit for before I go. The UK is in the Guinness World Book of Records as the country from which most countries have gained independence. Since 1939, 62 countries have gained independence from Westminster and not a single one has ever looked back. Yeah. Only one country has ever decided to stay and look where it has gotten us. I've been saying since 2014 that the UK is arguably a sinking ship. Would you really stay on a sinking ship for fear that the lifeboat wouldn't work. But actually, five years on, I do a disservice. It's better than a lifeboat. It's a ship. And it's a ship where you are welcome, no matter your color, your creed, your sexuality, your gender. If you are here and you want to make this a better place, then mon in. Two countries, Scotland, let's be 63. Thank you.